thank you very much for that, uh, Matt. Um, and don't worry, there will be plenty of questions on the jungle uh, in a bit. Right. But I thought we'd go back to, you said, you know, wanting to show yourself and ex express things in, in your way to the pandemic in your own words through uh, your, your diaries released a few months ago. Um, and a lot of, I realised a lot of what you said and told to us was similar to, please can we not have any filming? Um, 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 a lot of what you said was the same accounts in your book, the, the Times article on the 1st of January 2020, your first awareness of a new pneumonia-like disease in China. Um, Just a second, why are we not having any filming? Because we're professionally filming it. If people oh, have okay, fine. Up, I've signed um, a consent form, by the way, <laughs> so for, it to, for it to go out. Everyone I just thought it would be an irony to do a thing about how we should be open and transparent and then uh, not have any filming. Just everyone puts their phones up. All right, all right, all right. I apologise. <laughs> um, so how much of the book, of your diaries, were actually taken from accounts written during the pandemic? Yeah. And what is the concoction of WhatsApps and memos that you and Isabel Oakshot drew up together? Yeah, so the, it's a, you know, I've, written this, I've written this book, um, Pandemic uh, Diaries, um, and it is, um, it is my best shot at explaining what I was thinking at the time. So it's drawn up from notes I made at the time. And I, I didn't really have time to write a diary in the entry form, but I wrote, I did voice memos to myself, which I recorded. Um, the messages, it's amazing when you, when, because so much of life is now got, delivered either on email or WhatsApp, there are, you can chronicle what happened through looking at the, all those um, and then being in, interviewing other people, and then being interviewed by Isabel Oakshot, um, who asked me questions about each individual day. So it is the best shot at doing that. Now, and I set this out in, in the book, because somebody criticized it for saying it wasn't actually a contemporaneous diary. It's, it's exactly what I say it is, which is it's the best way of doing that. Um, and I've tried not to have hindsight in writing it. That is n naturally hard, because you know I've put it together, um, after the events have happened. Um, but all of the direct quotes in it are direct quotes from materials at the time. Um, and it is a, um, it, it's the best shot of explaining why we took the decisions that we did. The other significant criticism that's been leveled at it is that it's quite, I mean, perhaps naturally so, sympathetic of yourself and um, your conduct. Well, I wrote the it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's often said that one of the, what makes a brilliant political diary, like those of Alan Clark or Chips Channon or, or Sasha Swar or Tony yeah. Ben, yeah. is. Um, God, complete... Sasha Swar is going to be thrilled to be in that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, well, it leads on to what I'm about to say, which is that it includes honesty and yeah. lots of embarrassing facts yeah. about individuals. Yeah. What do you think? Are the key points in your diary that reveal this honesty? In these yeah. Moments so moments. look, it is not a, um, a you know a cheerful, chipper diary like Alan Clark's or Sasha Swire's, you know, or a sort of it isn't waspish gossip. And the reason for that is because the subject matter is so serious. You know, there was a, um, uh, a this what was going on was really terrible, and. Um, so it doesn't lend itself, and it would be inappropriate to write a sort of gossipy diary as health secretary in a pandemic. Um, the, it, and I do go through, I go through in it some of the things where things went wrong um, and where mistakes were made, but I also explain why we took some decisions that we did that turned out to be uh, controversial. And the truth is that there are some parts of what happened in the pandemic which are, it's a bit like Rumsfeld's known unknowns and unknown unknowns. There, is, there, are, there are things that were, the things that went well and are deemed to have gone well, right? Like the vaccine program. There are things that went well but are deemed to have gone badly, right? Like we never actually ran out of PPE, right? And that, but it, 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 but it, it was very close and some individual places did, but we didn't as a country. Um, but that was obviously deemed to have gone terribly. There were things that genuinely went badly wrong and, um, uh, and were deemed to have gone uh, badly wrong. Um, like we tried to build the, um, the app and, it, uh, and Apple said, we're not gonna allow it to work on our phones and it knocked the whole thing back by three months and the whole thing was a total um, fiasco. Um, and then there are things in the, other, the fourth category and I can't remember which way around that, that is. Um, things that are, um, oh, things that uh, are deemed to have gone well, but actually didn't. Uh, and there's a few of them in the book as well. 
Um, the, um, so so uh, what, I'm trying to, what I was trying to do was just give a warts and all, but that does include explaining why we made decisions, even if they were controversial at the time. Just to pick you up on something you said there regarding the things that um, are deemed to have gone badly but actually went well. You talked about PPE and the, um, how we obtained it. Yeah. Even if we didn't run out of PPE, at least I don't think the reason it is the, the PPE obtaining is deemed to have gone badly is because we ran out of it, but because the process resulted in billions of pounds going to the family, yeah. friends, spouses of, of Tory donors and Tory MPs. Um, do you see this as being a mistake or do you think it was part and parcel of the how quickly the process needs to be done? Well, I didn't have anything to do with any of the contracts. I mean, one of the things that is frustrating is that I get a load of, I get a load of flack for it, right? Um, despite the fact that I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, and by the way, my pub landlord never got a contract. That is just rubbish uh, that has been repeatedly um, written and is now written in an extremely careful way to avoid um, libel action. Um, so there is a, you know, there are, there are stories that got going that were just, just nonsense, you know. The, um, and I, I, it's true, I opened this guy's pub. Um, and then he, and he also had a plastics uh, company and he um, uh, and he turned the plastics to making the little tubes which were needed. My response on all of that is that we were in a desperate need for this life-saving equipment and we threw everything at getting it. And, it yeah, and yes, it meant that we couldn't use the normal procurement processes, but that was correct because we didn't have the three months it would take to use the normal procurement processes. Um, with hindsight, would it have been more politically convenient and better for my reputation if we had gone slower? The consequences, more people would have died. It would have been better for my reputation. There's no way I would change that because people, more people, because we had to save lives. And there's one moment which I do detail in the book when I, when I have this problem and I turn to my aide, Alan Nixon, I say, I don't care if it kills my political career, we're going to do what's right here. Um, and, um, uh, you yeah, know, I don't accept sympathy for that, but I was, uh, uh, you know, the, we were throwing everything at it, and we, we had a, um, you know, uh, we were either going to absolutely hit the nail on the head of exactly buying the right amount of stuff, or we were not going to have enough, or we were going to have too much. And we've come out of the pandemic having bought too much. Well, of those three, I'd actually much prefer if we'd hit the nail on the head. But that nail is really small and we overdid it. And, but that's better than underdoing it. So even if we accept, um, and I suppose that the inquiry will look into this, that the process of just buying what we could, procuring what we could mm. to save lives was, 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 was the right one. Yeah. Does it not reveal something sinister and concerning about British politics that seemingly everyone capable of um, procuring PPE last minute, a substantial number of them had some connection to the Conservative Party MPs or donors? Um, I think it's um, um, interesting, isn't it? Because um, <laughs> <laughs> because um, there's, this, there's, this, um, there's this impressive politician, um, how shall I put this? Um, at the time, Rachel Reeves, who's a Labour MP and now the Shadow Chancellor, um, wrote asking for the companies she knew uh, to be considered, and they were all considered as well. So it basically was whoever, if you can buy PPE, were interested, um, and um, lots of people came forward, and subsequently the links between their, their various links uh, were, have obviously got a good airing. All I can tell you is that it didn't make any difference at the time. And indeed, in the one example, no, I can't talk about that because it's under uh, a legal case, but there's a, you know, there are examples. No, I really can't talk about it because it's in a legal case. But, there's a, but the, answer is, the, answer is, the answer is, all I did was said, we want as much PPE as possible. And when people came forward, and I, in fact, I went on the TV at the time and said, if you can get hold of PPE, then this is a national effort. Uh, and people uh, emailed me about it and I pinged on the emails to officials. You know, that is actually the right thing to do in the circumstance. The wider question of the amount of them who also uh, had links to uh, donors, do you know what? I just wasn't thinking about that at the time because it was just not important. What was important was getting was, you know, nurses on wards without PPE uh, and needing to make sure that they had the kit that they needed. One thing that does emerge from your diaries that, that is... Um 
attested to by many figures at the time, well, well, you were one of the leading proponents for the need to develop a vaccine right from yeah. day one. Yeah. A response that was sort of sometimes even mocked by yeah. people in uh, Department for Health and in Cabinet. Why do you think there was such hesitance for it within Whitehall and Westminster? Yeah. And what were the steps that Her Majesty's government took in those first few months of the pandemic yeah. to make sure that we were the first people to have vaccines? Well, I don't think that there was scepticism within the department. Um, but there definitely was across Whitehall. And there was this, it, it, it's all about the nature of uncertainty and projects that you don't know are going to be successful, right? I'll tell you what normally happens in government. What normally happens in government is if you want to do something, then um, the natural instinct is to work on it privately, work on it silently, not tell anybody about it, make sure it's definitely going to happen. And it's only when it's absolutely definitely going to happen that you then... Uh, announce it and say this is what's going to happen, right? That's the normal process. Super cautious, super careful, because you get so much flack when things go wrong, and when things go right, they get a footnote and everybody moves on to the next uh, crisis. Um, and sometimes it's even worse than that. It's that people focus on things that are inevitable in order to take the credit. Um, one of my... Um, what, uh, an MP who gave me... A former MP who gave me advice when I first was elected, um, I, I found out... I'm not going to name them because that might lead to a lawsuit as well, um, uh, gave me this piece of advice. He said, he, he, in the 80s, before BT, as it was, was um, privatised, he got hold of the list of where they were going to build new phone boxes in his constituency, and then he campaigned for them. And this was brilliant local campaigning because he'd find out where these things were going to be built over the next few years, and then he'd say, we need one exactly here. He'd organise a petition, he'd get a campaign, and the bloody thing was going to be built anyway. <laughs> um, and and, and, and his, his, his constituents thought he was amazing, because every time he called for a new phone box to be built, one got built. Um, but the point was that they were going to be built anyway, right? That is the normal way of... of, of, of uh, it's a caricature, obviously, although that example is real. But the... Um, it's a caricature of how things are done in, um, in, in these high-profile uh, uh, public roles. Um, in the, with the vaccine, we did exactly the opposite. There was no certainty that the vaccine was going to work. A coronavirus vaccine had never been developed before. Um, all vaccines can fail at every stage. They can fail on safety, they can fail on effectiveness, and then worse, they can be rolled out and then found to be more harmful than good when they go to very large populations. Um, and the, the, that uncertainty meant that a large swathe of Whitehall thought that this was essentially not wise uh, to put, your, to put F emphasis on it or to really drive it because who knows whether it's going to work or not. My view is exactly the opposite, which was you've got to back these things even when you don't know. Now, on testing, of course, we took the same approach. Testing and test and trace was not able to hold down the virus on its own. My view is it never was going to be able to do that. But because it couldn't sort of solve the problem, it, it got a lot of flack, despite the fact we built the biggest testing system uh, in, in Europe, and actually on the substance, it was extremely successful, but it got flack because people attached that same hope value to it, and then it couldn't solve the problem entirely. Whereas the, um, uh, uh, and, and I think maybe people were conditioned by that, and having watched that project, to then see the vaccine and say, well, oh, we're, not gonna, we're not going to throw everything at this, it might all go wrong. In those first few months, when information was very, very sparse. And as you've said in your opening remarks, it shows you the importance of making any decision on the amount of information you have. How helpful was the Chinese government, particularly given that they were the only people to have the fully sequenced coronavirus DNA? The world's leading research institute for coronaviruses is, by coincidence, the Wuhan Institute of Technology. Um, how helpful were they in those initial months in providing information, data, DNA sequencing, research, etc.? Um, they were briefly helpful for about three weeks. So they weren't helpful at all until um, the 31st of December because they, the Chinese system, and I don't know who within the, which bit of the Chinese system, suppressed the fact there was a problem. 
Then when it became so obvious that there was a problem uh, that they couldn't hide it, they put out a, uh, a, a global alert on the 31st of December. So essentially up to the 31st of December, extremely unhelpful. 31st of December, they warned the world. Um, they then published the, uh, the sequence, albeit a couple of days after they got it themselves, but nevertheless, they published the sequence. Um, and then they continued to engage for another couple of weeks. As the virus became global and we went from a, a Chinese epidemic to a global pandemic, um, they, for whatever reason, closed up again. And I think it's probably that they were, they were probably worried about getting the blame. And then they put a huge amount of effort into trying to ensure that this was seen as not a, of Chinese origin. Um, every previous pandemic, rightly or wrongly, had been named after a part of the world. Um, and they actually reasonably ensured that it wasn't described as the Wuhan uh, virus. You know, the previous one had been um, uh, SARS and, uh, and then MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, actually, some of, the, some of them in history have been wrongly named. Um, the Spanish flu did not come from Spain. Uh, it's just that the king of Spain got it. Uh, and so when it arrived here, it was known as the Spanish flu. So these, these geographical names of these pandemics is probably wrong. Um, and the Chinese insisted that uh, COVID was called a neutral name, not unreasonably. But, they, but in, terms of the, in terms of the data and the research, for, for essentially January, February uh, 2020, they were helpful. And after that, they, went, they reverted to the norm. I'm sure you're expecting this question at some level. Um, but in 2021, you were caught on camera in an embrace with a co-worker uh, in breach of the uh, government's COVID guidelines. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you any particularly targeted questions on that because Susanna Reid did that to great extent earlier this week. Yeah. But you said there, and I'm a celebrity, you apologised profusely, you've asked for forgiveness. Yeah. In your own words, what are you apologising and asking forgiveness for? when you apologise and ask for your Oh, advice. for breaking the guidelines. Uh, I mean, it is a... Um, because, because that was a failure of leadership. You know, part of... You know, when you're, when you're in these positions of leadership, part of leadership is driving the team. Part of it is setting the goals. Part of it is inspiring. Part of it is communicating with people. But part of it is, 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 is personal behaviour. And I thought hard about that all the way through the pandemic. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, I banned alcohol within the Department for Health, for instance. Um, I, I, and I thought that that was important and I uh, let myself down. Do you think it is unfair that you continue to be bugged by these questions, be it here on um, Good Morning Britain, whereas Rishi Sunak, who also broke COVID guidelines, is no longer haunted in the same way? I've just, you know, come to terms with the fact that it was quite a big event. Um, Is that a yes? <laughs> <laughs> I know you want the whip back, but... <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 yeah, it is what it is, eh? I'm only human. <laughs> yes. You also said on Good Morning Britain this week that... Um, when you were being questioned about, you know, yeah. do you feel like you got away with it, you weren't fine? Got you away said, with it? I mean, that was it. a ridiculous question. Do you think you've got away with it? I mean, honestly. So where, yeah. My question Have they been is, living under a rock? How has it been dealing with the constant and unrelenting criticism that's come, you say quite rightly, uh, as, as a result of your actions? Has it been difficult? It's funny because, uh, especially since the jungle, but, but also to a lesser extent before that, um, the public are forgiving. You know, um, and the people I uh, meet and in, interact with and, uh, and certainly colleagues in Parliament, um, people get this stuff and most people know that, you know, life doesn't go in straight lines. Um, but that doesn't make me not regret it. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, uh, some people, there are, there are people... Uh, I, I think there's, something, there's a gap between them where the public are and the media are, really. That's, the, that's what I'd say, the central thing. And I, I, partly I went on I'm a Celebrity to demonstrate that, to show that we're only human. Uh, and in a democracy, it's good to be governed by people who are, um, who, who are, uh, are willing to admit their human uh, frailties 
uh, as opposed to pretend everything's uh, always perfect. Uh, and, I've, and there isn't enough space in the political debate for that. And ironically, by talking about it on primetime ITV from several thousand miles away, um, we could, we had, that was the, we ended up with the best, you know, the most sort of human, normal, person-to-person -person discussion about it that I'd, that I'd had since, because it was a, dis, you know, it was a sort of natural discussion, as opposed to the, you know, the, the more gotcha elements that you see in the, in the media. But on a personal level, has it been difficult to deal with the constant? Yeah, of course, look, of course it's been difficult. And uh, of course it has, but it's, that's life. That's, and yeah, that's you, life. Is that pressure shared by most of your parliamentary colleagues? And do you think it's an unhealthy part of our system? Oh, I see. Well, most, thankfully for them, most of my colleagues don't have to deal with the same level of um, scrutiny. But there is an interesting question there, you know. Um, the... Um, um, there, is a, there is a need to have this positive, more respectful dialogue in politics. And I believe this before the pandemic. And in fact, at the height of the pandemic, there was really, there's a really good example of when it worked well. You know, there were a few months when actually the media were... were constructive, of course critical, of course questioning, but essentially respectful of the fact that none of us had enough information to be making the decisions we were, and we were all doing our best. Um, and um, that level of respect, I think, is important, and respecting that everybody involved is a, is a you know, is a, is a, it, it has humanity. Um, and it needs politicians to act, because I think we need to be more... Uh, respectful of people on the other side of the political divide. You know, this is a particular problem, much bigger problem in America, um, but still, um, a uh, it has been a problem here, um, uh, uh, less so. Um, and I think it's a problem with this the dance, as I call it, between the politicians and the media. Um, you know, it is a I, I, it's a statistical fact at the moment that. Your, the rate of mortality amongst our MPs is higher than in the army, right? And the level of, um, and, and that is a problem, you know, in a democracy, um, we've lost three MPs in the time I've been involved and that is not good. Um, and part of it is because of a level of uh, vitriol and of course the it's a reinforcing nature of debate on, on social media. But that's the, that's the subject of a whole other discussion. I think it's very, very interesting and it's very difficult and it, uh, difficult to get right uh, as a society, but I think it's absolutely necessary. And I have particularly strong views on it, both having been the culture secretary who introduced the thinking that led to the online harms bill um, and the idea that the, that the internet should not be a libertarian space. Again, coming back to applying political philosophy to the real world, the internet should not be a libertarian space where you can do what you like. It needs to be a space governed by liberal principles that you can essentially do what you like um, so long as it doesn't harm others, and then you have to define what harm means. Um, and um, that say, uh, so I'm interested from that point of view, but I've also had a particular personal uh, experience uh, that has uh, that 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 has led to really thinking hard about the the challenges of how do you have robust accountability, uh, but also respectful debate. Um, I'm aware we started slightly late, so um, I'm going to ask one or two more questions, have some quick fire questions to Matt, then open up to questions from the audience. Um, we'll probably go on slightly past six o'clock. If you feel you need to go, please slip out quietly, but also please do stay if you can. So last couple of questions from me, Matt, if that's okay. More about the health service going forward. Sure. Um, are you in, do you think there is a need for a national care service? Uh, no. Um, what do you think these... <laughs> Well, you that's said they were quick I, 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 Okay, so, and the reason for that is that... Sorry, that's my fault. Uh, the reason for that is that, is, that there's, is that care is provided in such a, such an, um, a huge variety of ways that I don't think that nationalising the provision of care is a good idea. I do think there need to be reforms to how it's funded, uh, but I don't think that nationalising the provision 
would be a solution. What matters is getting the right care to the right people and making sure that uh, that's affordable. Um, and last question before the quick fire round, so I should have made that clear. Um, what do you think the largest problem facing the National Health Service is? Uh, the terrible use of technology and the fact that part of it is still run on paper. Probably the largest organisation in the world that still relies on paper and fax machines. I tried to ban the fax machines about five years ago and they still, they're still there, whirring away, <laughs> spewing out people's private medical information to whoever might walk past and pick up the pieces of paper. It's terrible. Maybe this says more about the age of our members, but I have never used a fax machine. Um, and I'm sure it's the same for most people in this room. So clearly we can never go work for the NHS. Um, <laughs> but no, quick fire questions. Okay. Favourite bush tracker trial? Uh, the, um, the, the swimming octopus one. Least favourite bush tracker trial? Uh, eating. Which one? I only did the one eating trial and it was awful. <laughs> yeah. Um, the drinking the half a pint of uh, smashed up cockroach, really disgusting. I tried to think of it as a protein shake, didn't work. <laughs> um, Boris or Rish Rishi? Yes. Can we not, not no, no hope of an answer there? Hey, um, well, I, so I, you know, I, I'm very close. I, I, I work very, very closely with Boris. Uh, I strongly supported Rishi to take over. Uh, I, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to choose. Do you want the whip back? Uh, yeah. Um, Oxford, okay. Although it's really old, this whip thing, right? Because what the whip means is, A, you can stand as a Conservative MP. Well, I don't want to do that. B, you can serve on a select committee as a Conservative. Well, I'm not planning on doing that. C, you can get told what to do on your Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday evenings. Well, thanks very much, guys. <laughs> but yes, I, I, you know, it, that would be nice. I'm still part... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm still part of the Conservative family, even though I'm not a big C uh, Conservative at the mo MP at the moment. Um, Oxford or Cambridge? Oh, come on, that's impossible. I went to both. Exactly. Oxford. <laughs> um, do you have private health care? Nope. Uh, and last question, what's next for Matt Hancock? Answering all the questions from the floor. <laughs> Beyond being an MP, when you step down. Well, there's more to politics than Parliament, right? So I have this new following on social media, and I want to engage with that. <laughs> um, I, I, why'd you all laugh at that? <laughs> hey? Strictly. Um, I've got, so I've got this new following on social media. Uh, I'm a, as an influencer, is that what you, oh, why? <laughs> How do you do that? I've been trying to influence things before. Maybe I've been getting it all wrong. Um, there's a, um, uh, I'm, I'm quite keen if, I'm quite keen to do some uh, documentaries on, on big subjects. Um, and um, let's, and, and, and I'm, I'm basically going to spend 2023 working out the answer to your question, which is why I gave a glib answer at the start in the hope that you wouldn't follow up and then I wouldn't have to answer the question because I haven't, basically haven't decided. Strictly? Huh? Strictly? Uh, uh, no, I can't dance. <laughs> That's the point. And Whittacombe couldn't. She got very far. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right, on that, uh, questions to the audience. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand or membership card uh, and we'll call on you. Uh, we'll go to the uh, member with the jumper at the front here. Hi, thanks very much for your address. Um, you've spoken a lot about the importance of people understanding that politicians are normal people and that's how you've mainly justified the fact that you went on the jungle. And I think that that's all well and good. But the fact remains that We've seen, even in the past couple of years, kind of numerous scandals, yeah. numerous blunders. And I think that the majority of people feel incredibly frustrated, distrustful of politicians and very, very disillusioned. And I'm not sure that the solution to this is, for example, a House of Commons Love Island. Not that anyone would want to see that. And so I wondered what you thought, kind of moving forward, the solution was for people who feel just incredibly disillusioned with politics yeah. today. Okay, so a great question. Um, the, my, my absolute first answer, if you're disillusioned in politics, right, is you've got to get involved. It is incumbent on you to get involved if you feel disillusioned in it, because politics is done by the people who turn up. Um, and of course, there's a whole process to that, but the idea that politics in the UK is exclusionary is completely wrong. Um, anybody can get involved. Not everybody can end up in the cabinet, obviously, or, or as an MP, uh, but everybody can get uh, stuck in and have a fair, um, a reasonably fair crack of the whip. whip. Probably more reasonable as a, um, it's probably more meritocratic than almost any other uh, country in the world. So the first thing is get stuck in and get involved. Um, the, um, 
the second thing is that um, the um, you know the nature of the nature of politics is that uh, people are people get frustrated that they their views can't fully be implemented or won't fully be implemented by uh, the government. You can even support a government and not agree with everything that it does. Um, so in a way, the frustration is in, is is in the nature of it. The thing I think that needs to change is that the the way that um, you know the 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 line to take machine right um, in which the minister goes on the Today program gets shouted at um, and gives exactly the lines that they've been told to um, is is just so it's just, that is incredibly frustrating you know and I'm trained totally trained in that politics uh, I, I had a you know I, I worked for. Um, David Cameron and George Osborne um, as a, a you know, I, I, writing these lines to take. Um, I then served in government where collective responsibility is important because you, you can't, every minister has to trust that another minister is going to make a decision and they're going to back that decision in return for them backing yours. It's just uh, you can't run a government without it because government's so big it needs lots of people um, e each taking decisions and for the whole thing to hang together. But just a bit more sort of a bit more candor and a bit less pivoting. And by the pivot, I mean the bit where you don't answer the question, like you're one on what next, and I made a joke. That's a, jokes are good pivots. Yeah. Um, next question, please. Um, we'll go to the member in the green jumper at the back there very quick. Oh, I've got a question written down. Look at this. Wow, OK. Um, thank you very much for coming and taking questions. I accept that it can't be particularly easy to open yourself up to like random scrutiny. Um, Craig Bicknell moved his chair to comfort his grieving mother at yeah. his father's funeral before being moved away briskly and told he had to stay two metres away as per government guidance. This is what he said of you earlier this week. I fell in love. That is his excuse. Well, I love my dad, and yet I wasn't allowed to comfort my mum at his funeral. On the Diary of a CEO podcast last year, you said that you fell in love, and it was out of your control. What do you have to say to hundreds of thousands of people like Craig, who throughout the pandemic were not allowed to comfort those they love deeply, including grieving family members, yeah. because of the rules you implemented? Yeah. So... Um, so the, um, the, the first thing, and I suppose in response to that, um, that, that important question is, it is exactly that uh, sentiment that I, which I understand entirely um, that I w that I'm asking for forgiveness for. There's a technical answer to the question, especially around funerals, where you know the rules. That was an example of where things uh, where we got things wrong. The rules put in place were interpreted too firmly and too harshly on the ground more so than we intended, but nevertheless they were. And when we heard about that, we changed them. So there's a direct answer to Craig and all those uh, who were in that situation, which was about, the, you know, because the clinicians were really worried about funerals as pay, places where there's often elderly people who often are close to others because of the need to comfort somebody who's grieving. Um, so there is a, so that's something that we must learn. Um, but that isn't the real point of the question, right? It's not actually about the rules about funerals, um, and I understand that. Um, all I can say um, is that you know, throughout almost all of the pandemic, I was extremely um, assiduous uh, on those rules. Um, and then um, I wasn't, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. I'm, I'm, I, I, all I can do is, uh, is, is be totally upfront about that. 
As a quick follow-up to that, you claim you were assiduous the rules up until the point you got caught. But no, not... that's not true. That's not, that's not fair, actually. <laughs> no, let, let, let Mr Hancock respond. No, that's, that's not fair, because um, I was, my, point, my point is that I let myself down because I, was a, I understood the importance of behaving as um, the gentleman um, who was um, asking the question would have liked me to and then didn't. And that is, and, and I put my hands up to that. Do you think that Boris, Rishi, and um, the others on both sides of the house who were also found being guilt, um, guilty of breaking the guidelines should be as subjected to those questions as you are? Huh. Yeah, well, I'm certainly subjected to them. You know, um, I think everybody, everybody, it, everybody who made the rules should follow them, you know? Everybody who made the rules should follow them. Should they be subjected to the same questions? They've been subjected to a lot of questions. Um, and um, um, should, to the, whether it's to the same extent as me or not is second order. Uh, the point is, and I think actually this is an important, you know, it's an important thing, that those who make the rules should follow them. Next question, please. We'll go to the member in the white on the front bench. Thank you very much. Um, you've spoken about the need to focus more on technology in the NHS um, and also about the next pandemic, which I'd love to hear a little bit more about. Um, given that we are in a cost of living crisis and a recession, there's the war against Russia, how are we going to fund the increase in technology in the NHS that you think is so vital? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so, well, look, it's a, it's a great question, but ultimately the question is how are we going to fund the NHS, right? I believe very strongly in the NHS and in the, in the point, in the need for a system that is free at the point of use, because I think it binds us together as a society. Um, it means that we can worry, we have to worry less than they do in other countries where you have to pay your, your health dues or you have to pay yourself. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's good for the, uh, for the country. The point about the technology isn't the cost of paying for it. It normally brings costs down. Uh, but that needs to be, the technology use has to be improved. Yes, that might involve some upfront cost, but it's small compared to the enormous cost of um, not having an NHS that's, uh, that's, uh, that's good enough, frankly. But I would say it's not just the technology, it is about having more people as well. I'm, I simply observe that there are record numbers of both doctors and nurses in the NHS. You know, I pledged 50,000 at the last election and we're on track to deliver them. Um, are you? Yes. Oh, well, I, the, I, I, I'm not... I, going on strike, Last currently. time I looked, yes. And certainly when I left office, we were, and last time I looked, uh, we are on the 50K, but, I, but it's not my, you know, it's not me anymore. Um, but, but the point is, there's record numbers of doctors, there's record numbers of nurses, and yet we still have the NHS under enormous pressure. That means we need to do something differently, and we need to deliver it better, not just keep doing more of the same. What do you think needs to be done differently in the NHS and is the current government in any states deliver that? Um, well, they actually, I thought their thing that they put out last week was pretty smart in terms of preparing for next winter. Um, but that's just sorting out the immediate problems, vital as that is. Um, the critical thing is that when you, ha when you are ill, I want everybody who's treating you to be able to have access to what others who are treating you have done to all of your test results and to have as much data about you as possible. That does not happen. Um, and there are endless examples of how that doesn't work. And as a result, you go in for test and in for test and in for test and the resources are spent over and over again gathering the same information uh, that the NHS has already got somewhere on its system and it can't all talk to each other. And the, the, therefore, there is huge wasted effort and waste of time by clinicians uh, because they simply don't use a modern uh, data structure as much as they, as they should. Last question, please, um, from the member in the check shirt in the front row. 
Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the harm principle earlier, uh, and I'd just like to hear your response to whether... To which? Harm to, to the harm the principle. The harm principle, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, do you think that perhaps more damage was caused to the economy and to children's education? There are children going into uh, secondary school now who still don't know their times tables, yeah. um, which is obviously a big issue. And yeah. the economy has taken a big hit, which yeah. is the same economy which funds the NHS. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how do you defend lockdown yeah. against the wider impacts? Yeah, I think this is a really important question and one of the things that we need to... Uh, we need to learn. Uh, we were cognizant of and thought about the harms of lockdown. Of course we were, and of course we did. They were very hard in advance to quantify the impact on children's education, the impact on mental health, the impact on the economy, um, the impact on other health conditions, if you had cancer, for instance. So we knew that, there were, that lockdown was damaging. This is why in any normal time you wouldn't do it. The problem was that what was facing us as an alternative was much, much worse. Um, you know, the, the problem with these forecasts that became well known, um, the problem wasn't the forecast, the problem was they were coming true in the data. And so we, we held in our minds these, um, the harms and we knew about them. Um, and we were choosing, as often you have to do in government, between two really bad options, where lo lockdown it was a bad option but not locking down was worse. Um, we now know far more about the impact of lockdown. And I think that the second lockdown was, was we, we, we managed in that to have a smarter set of rules from learning something, but now with time, we should be able to think about it even more to try to keep more things going and more of normal life going if we ever have to do it again, which I hope that we don't. Um, and to be better prepared uh, for, for, for last time. So unlike those who say that vaccines don't work, who, who are just completely wrong and unscientific, the question you ask from a sceptical point of view is totally reasonable, and we have to balance those harms against the harm that would have happened. But I just leave you with this thought, which is in public debate and in politics, often the hardest thing to discuss is what didn't happen. So in this country, because of this pandemic, one, because of the nature of the virus, children were not affected. That is absolutely, it was a saving grace. I mean, imagine this whole thing, if it had affected five-year-olds as much as it affected 85-year-olds, it would have been even worse. Two, the NHS was never overwhelmed. The work, people were not refused care because of a lack of space in the NHS. We got extremely close to that twice. It happened in Italy, and if that had happened, far more people would have died. And three, if we hadn't locked down, we would have had many, many multiples more uh, deaths. And if you query that, look at what happened in China, where they tried to suppress the whole thing. Uh, they had all the downsides of lockdowns, but they didn't use the time to use a vaccine that works because they wouldn't use the international vaccines. They'd only use their own, and it is own, only has efficacy of about 50%. We're not quite sure. Um, and as a result, they've now got this terrible problem that that's, that's happening right now. Um, and therefore, um, the, um, it's, a, it's a totally reasonable challenge. I honestly believe that what we did was necessary, and I would take the same... Brought, you know, knowing what I knew then, I would take the same decision. But by God, we've got to learn so that the negative impacts are less bad and we can try to grip the situation uh, faster and better, having learned everything we've learned from the terrible period that we went through. And I hope that that's a respectful answer to an excellent question. Final question, which is a question we ask all of our speakers um, at the end of their talk, which is if you could give in two or three sentences um, one piece of advice to the members of the Oxford Union and the students of the University of Oxford, what would that one piece of advice be? Absolutely go for it. You've got the best, you've got the best start you could possibly have and there is, the world is your oyster. Um, it is a, it, there, you will, you, you, can, you can absolutely uh, succeed and so uh, carpe diem. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mr. Matt Hancock. <laughs>